All right, welcome everyone. We are on another edition of the podcast. We have Mr. Jason Kuhn from London. He's getting ready for the one million pound Triton buying the largest poker tournament in the history. Jason, how you doing? I'm great, man. It's good. To, it's good to hear from you, man. It's been crazy. I know we uh, we've you know, you know back, I was looking back. We were just discussing. I had my son, 2014 Burning Man, one of the greatest weeks of my life. We were running around having fun in the desert. Um, that that was uh, that was a pretty incredible experience. And you know, since then, you were already w- one of the top of the totem pole in poker. You've blown up in the last few years. Pretty crazy to see the results. So it's it's nice to kind of catch up, go back and look over some of your career. Those of you that know, I got my son screaming in the background. I'm mean, actually, it's, it's distracting me, but um, it, it's pretty, it's an honor to have you here, man. You know, it's really great to watch you blossom. One of the great guys in poker. And, and I just wanted to kind of uh, go through a little bit of your career for those of you that may not know Jason. If you know poker, you know Jason. Um, but maybe tell me a little bit, Jason, how it all started. When was it some turning points for you? You started playing poker uh, before college, in college. I know you're from West Virginia. You did graduate. Kind of walk us through a little bit of your the beginnings of Jason Kuhn poker. How did it come about? And and talk to me about the early stages. Sure, man. Um, it was kind of one of your typical stories, really. It's, it's I guess it's the the very beginning is kind of interesting because I don't have like uh, no one in my family played poker games, and I didn't play poker at all in high school. Some of my friends did, but I was just like, no, nah, I'm not trying to uh, lose my money to you guys. And then. In college, I was a sprinter. I was a very competitive uh, Division II sprinter um, at a Wesleyan College. And I had an injury, and whenever I was hurt, I started playing online poker because of a friend's recommendation. Like, we played uh, play money stuff. And within, like, six months, I was I, had, I was winning a lot of money given that I had none to start. That's So you, you start playing. You get, you get a little bit hot. You're playing online. I remember back in the day on Full Tilt, some other sites, Nova Sky, I believe, was your handle on Full Tilt. And and when was what was the turning point for you where you were winning money, doing well? But what was that? Was there a major score? I think F tops, or maybe even before that, you had some stuff. But what was what was the jumping point where you went from okay, I'm doing well, this could be a living, into like wow, this is serious, six figure score. Uh, you know, you're ahead of the curve on what's going on. What, what was sort of a turning point where you took it to the next level? There were a few crazy, uh, crazy steps. I think the first one was I like the very first tiny one was I won a like a 30 K man, $11 tournament, uh, for like whatever, 25 K. And that started me. And then I played a lot of heads up, sit and goes. And, um, the next thing for me was I satellited into a one K buy-in tournament and I won that and it was for like, I don't know, 90,000 or something. And the real big break for me was in the spring of 2009. I had one of those crazy online poker weeks that you hear about like once or twice a career for somebody where I won the 1K on um, Mon- or on Tuesday or Monday. It was either in Full Tilt or Stars. And then I Thursday, I won a scoop for 300000 And Sunday, I won another tournament on full tilt for like 50,000 and that was a crazy week. And yeah, I mean, um, there were a lot of those, but you know, uh, there was, uh, there were a lot of ups and downs for me. I had, I was very spendy and, um, had never had money before in my life. So I thought that the amount of money that I won would go a lot further than it did. So I wasn't like one of these guys that was really disciplined and did all the right things with my bankroll and just kept working hard and building it up. Like when you hear stories of like, Ben 86 or sauce those guys won millions of dollars and they did it in like the cleanest way possible whereas me i was like i was like a like a young rapper from west virginia i got my hands on some money and i wanted all of i wanted to show everybody that i had made some well talk to me about your family because this is something always interesting in poker uh how how did they kind of, how did they deal with it you had success so early it wasn't an issue, but that initial time, was there any worries from family members, close friends were like, this is crazy. You know, you're gambling. You did finish school though. Right. So, I mean, that's because a lot yeah. of guys drop out. So that was cool. But like you for your family, I'm sure a little more reassurance, but how, how did they deal with that? Was that a, was that difficult conversation or did that sort of flow just kind of support you the whole way and no issue? 
I think in some ways finishing school kind of made it harder because I had a few friends that uh, I um, really admired and, and uh, gave me a ton of advice. Like I did, I've never had a father. So I had like some older friends in college that were kind of like father figures to me. And um, they, whenever I first started playing poker, even I didn't know if I had a gambling problem or not. I felt like I was like learning and I was okay, but I was like, is this what everybody says? Cause it kind of is like, this is what it sounds like, you know? Yeah. And, um, but I finished uh, undergrad and I also got an MBA and that was just like a result of, um, I had a red shirt year in track and I tried to come back at the end of college and I did, but I sucked. Um, but, but the uh, positive side to that was I, I did finish an MBA program and I got a job in Pittsburgh selling group insurance and a guy that I really respect and uh, a mentor to me helped me get that job. And I quit very, very quickly because one, I didn't like it. I knew it wasn't for me, but two, I, I really knew that I had something with poker and it wasn't my family. Like my mom was just kind of like, all right, yeah, do it. You know, you seem like a reasonable guy. Um, but all my friends that I admired were like, dude, you can't do this. Like, what are you thinking? Like <laughs> you're, you're at, you just like spent all this effort and you have school debt and you, you put all this time into finishing an MBA and you got a really good job and you're just going to bounce on it. And I was like, yeah, that, I did. That's, that's actually your Twitter top. Your Twitter, I think is my, one of my favorite lines just saying, spend five years in college to work three weeks and quit. Now I play poker. You know, and then you're with Party Poker, Triton Poker Ambassador. But it's just funny because, you know, most of the guys who did college at, at, at your level where they were making a lot or doing really well, you kind of hear about the dropout stories or they did they went for a year, semester, this kind of thing. But you actually did finish and then you, it didn't take you long to, to realize. So I, I love that on um, on your Twitter. That's uh, so. All right. So you, you graduate college, you get in and then you're in the real world. You start playing some poker. And I, I want to go through your kind of run over here on I, I'll show it'll show on screen uh, you won't be able to see it but I'm just going back to Hendon Mob for the live Ooh. poker so this is this to me is always fun to sort of scroll through um, careers and, and and that one of the things about Hendon Mob is fun to see the flags where you were what was going on it sort of you know it blends together at some point so to kind yeah. of look, take a take a walk down memory lane here so your first ever score July 6 2008 you get 17th in a 1k in Las Vegas so was this you know, was this, had you played any like side tournaments in West Virginia, casinos or local places maybe that don't show here? Or was this literally your first trip, 2008, you go out to Vegas and you're just in there firing, firing out. How, what was that like your first time going and playing in a tournament? I think my first tournament was in some like sketchy casino in West Virginia, like Wheeling, uh, where I like my brother and I like chopped my buy-in or something and, and right. I busted and I felt really bad because I wanted to win my brother money. But yeah, I think the, the, I remember the Vegas trip was actually the main part of that was to go see my friend, um, uh, Nick Ramponi at the time. And, um, he got deep in the main event that year. And that was the first event that I'd played, but I still, um, even at that point in 2008, this is, I'd already quit my job. I, Hold up. Nope. I quit my job the fall of 2008. So if I would have played a tournament in Vegas in, in the summer of 2008, then I was still employed, actually. So I must have just taken a trip to see my friend and played a small tournament. And that was like a little bonus. Okay. So Joe, so 2006, you're just, you, you mess around, or I'm sorry, 2008, you play one. I'm looking just kind of fast forward a little. Uh, nothing but I still have a job, you know? Okay, so yeah, you're you still have a job. Now all of a sudden, you know, go to it takes a little while. There's not much really live. You maybe you're playing online, but then you have a you have a fourth place at in Las Vegas again, 10k. So you hit a 225k score. That's got some meat on it. You're up to that that oh, you know yeah. six figure score. Pretty exciting. And is this was this by this point you were playing a lot, online a lot, right? So 2010, you had already had some su big success online. Yeah, I was basically exclusively an online player from like 2007 to 2010. Um, it was like all I did. I, I grinded online and I played all the games. Though. That was kind of weird, like not all the versions of the games, but I played all the format of No, no Limit Hold'em. A lot of these guys are specialists, but I kind of played like mid stakes to high stakes sit and goes. I played high stakes tournaments and I would also play low to mid stakes cash games. Okay, so yeah, you're doing, yeah, all right, so you're fully immersed now in poker. 2012, um, January, you get fourth in the PCA, 25K, nice score, 271. You got, you know, 2012, second in a WSOP. 
you, you're getting some scores. You're getting some scores. I mean, you're definitely well known and respected in the poker world at this point. You're definitely, you know, I knew we, I had known you, but also I, I knew you from from poker and also off the table. But when, when was I'm just kind of going through? It looks like I do remember vividly when you sort of broke out. Like, you, would you say for live poker was there? Talk to me when you sort of said, you know what, I'm gonna, I need to kick it up, or I want to get into the high stakes uh, arena here, because I, I see that you know, even now, 2013, you got some scores. Um, you know, I, I do remember when you sort of just blew up, and it was just like, it was just like, yeah. look out, like you just took over. Um, but w- what point live? Do you remember at a series, a stop? Did something trigger for you? Did, were it, was it the group of friends or people you were hanging out with a lot and you just decided, I want to take this up a notch? Like, where, where did it kind of ignite for you? Because I'm looking, you know, even here in 2013, some good scores. Um, I mean, the heater, the heater you go on, and, and we'll get it, we'll kind of scroll through here more. But what for you was like a turning point where you just like, it was just like, man, this is, I'm at another level now. For life in particular? There were, there were two major turning points for me. So um, it wasn't necessarily just like live poker has always clicked for me. I think I understand the human element. And I enjoy it. I feel comfortable playing live poker. Um, so it wasn't just like um, something happened for me live. What actually happened for me, there were two huge moments. One, the uh, after Black Friday, I became very close with Ben Tolerine, Ben 86, and we ended up moving in together. And um, I got to observe the way one of the best players in the world studied the game. And I got to uh, understand his attitude. And I just realized that my entire career, I wasn't approaching poker from the right direction. I, I, was, I wasn't motivated enough. I wasn't pushing myself enough. And I wasn't using the right resources to learn the game. So once I started seeing the way that he did it, I, I couldn't learn the way that he could do because... He was just more talented than me and he had a higher threshold of like he could study for eight hours and I could only study for three hours uh, with him before I got really tired. So it was like kind of brutal on me because I saw this guy who was playing 501 K and just crushing. And um, in a lot of ways it really lowered my self esteem because I just, uh, I admired, I admired and still admire him so much, but it was just hard to be around somebody that was so damn good. And but it was also the most motivating thing in the world. Well, that was that. That was in Vancouver. Yeah, I think actually I remember visiting there you and I think I came over and you were showing me a few things. Uh, I stopped by yeah, your apartment and I and I remember like I, I do actually have that exact feeling. I remember kind of being like, yeah, this is this is some high level stuff. Like I'm I'm definitely not in the you know there there's a there's like a whole nother world there's like okay being an okay poker player and understanding the game and winning some at some degree or beating your opponents but then there's yeah you're realizing at the highest level there is there's some there's some matrix stuff you know it's not a it's not an accident it's completely different yeah it's it's not an accident at all it's just completely different the level of professionalism and focus and commitment um all of the top players the most elite players they all share that trait of like obsession you know like they're truly it is them like the game of poker is their part of it and there's a lot of people that you see that are very bright talented people that are good poker players but they aren't i mean not everyone can be the best you know what i mean like a very very small group gets to be the best that's the way it works and that small group is it's ridiculously intimidating to observe how how well they do it yeah i that's yeah that you know i so i was and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is something that I was uh, reading on. I think you either said in an interview or uh, either either on video or in a in a written blog, basically saying that your biggest accomplishment in poker uh, has to do with achieving that, despite being in your own assessment, only slightly better than middle of the road when it comes to natural ability for the game. Um, you're not you're saying you basically, and again, I'm quoting you. I think so. Just correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying that you're not one of the savants like many of the guys you see at the top of the game, but your work ethic and ability to execute and perform under pressure are elite, uh, but the raw talent isn't. And I mean, I think that's, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of what I hear you saying, and based on here, it's like showing that you're saying, like, look, I'm not a, I'm not a super wizard sorcerer genius, 
but I'm, you know, I, I see what it takes. You've worked, you know, maybe harder than anyone or just as hard as anyone. And you've really dived in to, 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 to hone into that ability to compete and be one of the best in the world. So, I mean, is that, that's what I hear you saying and, and just kind of realizing how much, how hard that is to do. And again, I quote me, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's sort of what you're saying is like, you know, you, you don't, you, you feel like you've really worked super hard on your game. Is that, is that correct? Or do you, is that statement? That that was pulled off. Yeah, I, I was doing some research, it, but I... yeah, it certainly is. It's there's there are a few things to it though. Like the first layer is is like I was raised in trailer parks and raised in like really poor like farmhouses and and was never education was never valued in my household. You know, it was like so the first thing like I think through my twenties I actually was like. I questioned my own intelligence a lot, but it was more, I think, like I just wasn't given the tools at a young age to really start to master things like math and science and and um, logic and learning and efficiency and learning that a lot of kids like from solid, solid backgrounds that they they have those um, gifts as young kids, you know, so like like I had that against me to begin with, like a lot of these guys are from classical math backgrounds. And on top of that, they're outrageously talented. So the first element to that was like the education thing. Like, even though I have like higher education after school, I was kind of like a jock slash poker player in college that was pretty bright and just got through, you know, I right. wasn't like, like a committed, like Timofey Kuznetsov, who's like a mathematician. I just wasn't me. Right. And on top of that, like, I feel like my ceiling of aptitude is lower than just from being around these guys and competing against them. I think a lot of the top guys just have higher aptitude than me. So I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, luckily, poker is a very deep, complex game. And if it were just us sitting around solving math problems, I would be like a, a, a one-two grinder. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but there's a lot more to it. And I love competition. I love, like I said, the human element. I love, even though I'm not a starey guy, like in live poker, I'm very dialed into the physical and live elements of poker, I think, that... I'm uh, naturally talented at that. And I, I will, like, I decided, like, this was what I was going to do. And I was going to be the best that I could possibly be, even if it killed me, you know? And that meant, like, I would be alone for months on end, grinding every single way I could learn. Like, I remember, like, um, I was in Vancouver and I went to Whistler for a month by myself once, literally a month. Um, and I was in this like Harala Bob actually had this big ass cabin and he wasn't in town and he was like, yo, you can just stay at my place. It's an amazing place. And I just sat there in that cabin and I grinded it. And I, this was in maybe 2014 or something. And I remember like playing, like I would play like 3000 hands of zoom a day. And, um, I remember like, I, I was like a stalemate for like 20,000, 30,000 hands. I remember like putting my head on the table and crying, like, crying by myself in this cabin like like you don't have what it takes i remember feeling like that because i decided to step out of the live poker uh realm and not come back until i felt like my fundamentals were the best they'd ever been and like really elite and like i had like a few of these moments where i just really felt like i wanted to give up and i felt like i didn't have what it took and honestly it's like um thank god I, i've been so persistent because i have had plenty of excuses to quit poker um and, you know, and, and like I said, even during doing this interview, there is a little bit of survivorship bias because like, you know, I'm probably like above, like if there were a thousand iterations of Jason playing poker tournaments and cash games and all this, I'm probably running above EV, you know, like not just poker, like life wise, opportunity wise, the, the relationships that I've built. Like, I feel like that, you know, I'm sitting here telling you this story uh, about like how I made it and how things worked and how I do things well. But, like, I'm probably pretty damn lucky, too, you know? So a lot of good things have happened for me to get here. The other major point is um, my fiancé, who was my girlfriend, um, whenever I kind of started really lighting up in poker, is, um, that wasn't by coincidence. She, she left her job to travel with me, handle my bookkeeping, make sure I was fed, keep my head up whenever I was getting crushed. And on top of that, I was like, okay, this is the first time in my life that I realized um, this is the person I'm going to go the distance with, and I need to get my shit together and make some make some wealth here, so we can 
we can get this done. And that was like, you know, four years ago, five years ago or whatever. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, I, I know Bianca from, I met, met her several times, including uh, Burning Man. That was fun where we were there. I want to talk about that a little later too. But how, talk to me about that and how supportive and how important that is because poker is a blessing in terms of schedule in a way with freedom. But it's also, I mean, it's very daunting. It's very demanding. Like you, there's times where you said you got to just go in the matrix. Plus, you know, it's of course – Handling ups and downs is important, and I, I would imagine you're one of the best at being able to, to to separate the two. But there's no question, busting 100k or or 500k or a million dollar, you know, the tournaments or or cash game. You you've been involved in the biggest, I believe, the largest cash game pot in the world, winning and losing. Maybe at the time it within very quickly. I mean, though, that's that's very intense. Like I I know when I bust a tournament, no matter what. If I you know my wife who you know Amelia and she'll she it's a little different, right? Different different stakes. You know, but a five k or ten k buy in or twenty five k buy in, and it doesn't feel good and it's not fun to come home. And then they you know they but it's a very important to have great support. So talk to me about what that is. Um, for, for Bianca, how has that helped you? And, you know, how do you also deal with some of those swings? Like, on let, let's say on the, the, the ups are obviously easier. You pop a bottle of whatever. You celebrate, you, whatever that means to you. You have a good time. Everyone's in a great mood. But talk to me about those times where, you know, you do bust 100K or a high stakes buy-in. Like, how do you handle that? And how, how does that help to have Bianca or, you know, that kind of support with you? So it's great to have somebody who shoots it straight with you, pulls you back to reality, like doesn't let you feel sorry for yourself. You know, a lot of it's really like you want to feel worse than you deserve to feel. And, and that's really good. Like support is great. and Compassion is good, which she certainly gives me both of those. But at the same time, like I'm unrealistically upset sometimes. Like, like I'll come home, grumble, grumble, grumble. I didn't win the main event this year, you know, grumble, grumble, yeah. grumble you know, or whatever. It's just completely irrational thought. It's like, it's really good to have somebody be like, okay, you know, <laughs> have your beer and then let's, let's like actually talk about something that matters, you know, or whatever. Right. So, um, it, it's really good in that way. And, and she, she helps pull me back to earth and like really, you know, it, as cliche as it is, like helps me have gratitude for things and, and, and come back to seeing things from a rational point of view. And, uh, you were saying, you know, like I play higher stakes than you and you come home in this mood or I come home in this mood. It really doesn't matter. It's like we all feel the same way. I've felt the same physical sensation since I started playing this game. Um, it's like the stakes have gotten way bigger for me, but inside it feels exactly the same. And I'm sure that that's the same for everyone else across the board. And it's really um, it's an extreme thing what we do. And it requires thing about poker that other elements of like variance like there are other professions where you win and lose money like if you're a private business owner you know like you can come home poorer than you were the day that you went to work but with poker the thing that's really intense about it is you're always in kind of like a fight or flight state when you play like if you have to play if you want to play your best poker specifically live like you almost have to have spidey senses sometimes you have to feel it you know you have to like you, your whole body has to be dialed into this experience and in order to be your best, like your heart rate's like 30 beats per minute higher. You're doing this for like 10 hours straight. You're actually in like a fight or flight. Like your body thinks some crazy shit's happening. Yeah. And you do this three, 340 days a year. It's, it's a very different way to make a living. And it's really hard to just come back to being a normal human being after you spent 10 hours in that state of mind. So yeah. we do deserve like a little understanding here. It's not like you're coming home from your office job and just like losing your mind, you know? Um, True. So there is like, yeah, there's like a recalibration that we all need to go through. Um, but it's it's very, very important to um, figure out whatever that formula is that works for you to get you back to feeling like a normal human being as quickly as possible. For me, it's like do something active. So I just like get home, take a walk, look at the stars. I generally feel a lot better or get in a sauna, something like that. Um, so I've just figured out ways to get over that anxiety um, quicker. And, and tell me a little bit about, so at the highest level, just like anything, you know, there's, there is, uh, there's, there's just to find an edge, if you will, or to find a little bit of separation. I would, you know, it seems like everything's everyone in poker in general, especially at the highest stakes, you, I've noticed more health, more focus on mindset, meditation, working out, eating right. And I know for sure you do that and, and you, I, you know, I've seen 
how you eat and how, I know you train and you do that, but g- give me a little bit of um, how important you think that is and talk to me maybe a little bit about a routine on a typical tournament day. Are you up at certain time early? You know, cause I, you don't strike me as someone that would roll out of bed and go to the tournament. You probably, I would imagine you're up, you got, you're doing various things. Do you, do, are you super, super solidified in a routine? Like meditate, eat this time, do a workout, or does it kind of depend? Like, or, or do you put sleep above everything? Um, h- how do you prepare? Give me like a typical for this Triton, for example, biggest tournament in the world coming up. Do you do anything differently? Or is your tournament routine pretty much you like to have, you get to a, a venue early, like you're already in London, you get, you get acclimated to the time zone. And I mean, it's, it is like a sport. It's like a, being a boxer or, a, or an athlete. You, you do need to it does take a lot of preparation um, in, in, in planning. So talk to me a little about like a routine. Let's go through maybe Triton, like how what your week looks like or how this works. Yeah, so I got here seven days before the tournament starts. Um, I just want to make sure that my body is, is rested. Um, I definitely take it very, very seriously. I think that it's preparation is one of the things that we can control as players. So even if you're the best player in the world, if you're showing up unprepared, you're going to be B game, C game and players that are inferior to you are probably just going to be better than you in the tournament. Yep. Um, so I, you know, this is the biggest tournament of all time. I'm going to be here in time. I'm working out every day. I'm studying two a days every single day. I have been doing that for the last 40 days. I only played uh, six events at the world series this year and I didn't play any side events. I played six or seven days of cash games, but every single day since June, I've, done poker work and now i'm doing two a days every day as you know i have to get off this call so i can get to work i know uh, i appreciate squeezing it in man yeah. I, that's serious business yeah. I, I i like that that's yeah. uh okay so you're studying but like so so let's just take august 1st million dollar buy-in tournament let's just do that day what give me give me like a little bit of a glimpse at what your day would look like so by then i'll be i'll be calculated into my wake up time i'll probably get up at 9 30 that morning um i won't eat until probably the end of the second level of the tournament um but what i'll do is i'll do like a light routine i have um i'll lay on like an acupressure pad i'll foam roll i'll skip rope i won't do anything intense though i'll do i'll meditate if i feel like it if i don't feel like meditating i'll go out and take a walk outside and just kind of clear my thoughts um I I have like I don't know a bunch of bands and stuff I work out with. I won't do any heavy like gym work. I'll do heavy lifts and stuff this week going into the tournament and do a bunch of cardio and whatever just to get myself ready for 14 days of poker. But whenever I start playing, I do no heavy lifting, no heavy cardio. Um, I restrict my carbohydrates very intensely, which I don't do until I play. So I do like a moderate like kind of uh, slow carb diet that's like paleo based every every day of my life um but once i start playing i go fully ketogenic and i do uh, almost no carbohydrates and just tons of fat and i'll stay that way for 14 days so you probably see me lose like 10 pounds over over two weeks almost it'll be really really intense it's like this happens every trip like i'll come in about 180 pounds this trip and i'll leave 170 pounds Wow. So, okay. So there you go. Get a little, there it is. That's a little taste of how serious it is. I said, I want to say, so in this million dollar, very unique, um, where it's got the pro businessman dynamic, which is interesting because these 1 million pound, 1 million buy in this, uh, us. So this is 1 million pounds, 1.25 roughly, um, dollars makes it the largest buy in the history. And I think there's been a little bit of a, a, dis, a disparity in recent years. That's been a, a little bit of a problem with the high rollers. Um, you know, I know we've battled in alpha eights. We played the premier league together. This was, you know, 2013, 2014, the alpha eight didn't quite catch steam. You know, they, they got like 20, 21 players that kind of died down. Um, the Triton seems to have I love those stocks. Yeah, they're they're great. That was fun. It's 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 you know high production value, great great concept. But this Triton seems to really have addressed the problem, like the the issue with getting some business type men having a, a a mix, and now even to the point where they're saying we had you had to pair businessmen. And if a pro wants to play, I'm just looking here. I'm going through the pairings here. And in the format, uh, maybe talk to me also a little bit. I see you're paired with Bobby Baldwin. Is that something, have you known Bobby for a long time? Was that something, could you talk to me about the pairing process? Because not, not everyone who wanted to play this, it's a pro, got to play, correct? I mean, it's like, I'm sure there's guys on the sidelines. Oh, yeah. There's guys waiting to get in that maybe still might get in. But um, tell me a little bit about that, how you paired with Bobby Baldwin. And also the format where the pros 
are separated from the businessmen and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe go through a little bit of the format of this. I think the first six levels is what I was told or I, I believe, but maybe talk to me about how that works and why this is different and, and what that means. So my pairing with Bobby Baldwin, um, uh, I play a lot of cash games with Bobby. I've been friends with him for quite some time. Um, hilarious guy and an obvious legend. So I was very honored to be invited by him. Um, I know a lot of my close friends who are elite tournament players didn't get the invite. You know, that's a bummer uh, in a way. But this this is a unique tournament. It's not uh, – the fact that it's not an open tournament I, I don't think should cause an uproar. These are – these guys were sitting around having lunch one day, and they were like, hey, we want to have a really big buy-in tournament, but we want the – we want the – amateurs to stand a chance in this thing we want them to have a little more say than they usually have and you know what no no pro can argue with that because we get to play like one of the best value tournaments uh for this field size that we'll ever play and on top of that it happens to be the biggest one ever so um a lot of these guys were getting invited just because they're friends you know you take uh tom duan and uh paul Fall. tom's just very close friends with paul and and Paul said, hey, you know, Tom doesn't even play that many tournaments, but he's my pal. I'm going to bring him in. And, you know, you see that with uh, a couple of the other pros as well. So there is like a sentimental kind of value attached to this thing. And uh, um, a lot of players are in this. If it, if it were the list of, say, whatever, there ends up being 24 pros in this thing. For the list of the top 24 pros in the world, well, you know, a bunch of those guys aren't in here. Yeah, that so – yeah, I've, I've played cash with Bobby actually this year a few times, some some big Hilarious. games, and he is a great guy, man. He's really one of a kind, and and that's man, what an honor, what a what a sweat, because I, I like I, this is it's history. I mean, it's any time you can talk about the history of something that's been around for however many years, and you're in playing. I mean, it, I, I'm gonna I'm there. I'm gonna be commentating, which I'm like over the moon. It's such a treat, and, I, and even almost you know it's it's fun because get to enjoy it, get to see it firsthand and witness it go down. And, and for you though, to be actually a part of that and playing and have a chance for history anytime that's available, that's a, that's a unique opportunity. Um, what, what do you estimate the field size will be? I think right now it's 39 or 35, something around that. Is there, do you, do you think there's going to be some late ads? You're probably in the know on sort of how the, the shakeout's going to be, but do you, are there people there waiting? Like, are there a couple of like pros like in the area and they're like, man, I hope I get a call up last second or someone comes through. Like, what do you think the final number is? If I were to guess, I would say there's going to be, I mean, this is random, but I'm, I'm going to guess there's going to be between five to seven more. Um, uh, well, I guess I should say four to six more. There'll be, there might be like one rogue business guy come in without a pro, but if I were to guess, yeah, there's going to be three more teams come in. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's without like tons of Intel. I just feel like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger every second. And it's also getting better and better and better every second. It's not like you see, you know, every elite tournament player is just popping up into this thing. It's actually, if anything, it's kind of been the opposite. I've been the last, like whatever X amount of additions I've been going, Whoa, this is crazy. I can't believe there are more like random dudes jumping in this thing. And talk to me a bit about value in a tournament, because when you look at it from a perspective, when you play 100K, 25K plus, you know, whatever, 50K, these high rollers, what makes a tournament, you know, because when you look at some of the names on the pro side, like when you go and see a tournament, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm battling with True Teller and Jungle Man and, um, you know, the Wizards, let's just say the Wizard crew, but how much value does, let's say, someone that comes in that's, that's a non-pro or someone that's, you know, like even... Um, Richard Young, Paul Foy, Paul, you know, Paul's a pretty talent, like tough. He's played a lot of these and has pretty good results. He's no walkover for sure. But someone that you would say is not at the elite, elite level, how do you kind of um, equate, maybe explain the value in these high rollers when someone's maybe not necessarily a favor? Like, how, like so at the, I, the higher the buy-in, the more value it is, right? Because it's like, all right, well, someone's putting a million, there's a million pounds in the tournament that's, let's just say, not a shark or not a really great player. So how do you sort of calculate value in these spots? Like, I mean, this is what this is maybe the highest value tournament of all time. Would you say? Is that fair? Just because the buy-in and the, the mixture of non-straight pros? Like, how would you, is that the, is that the way to look I at it? I think one drop one was very, very good. But I think that since this is only 5% uh, going to charity, so you have to subtract 5% from your ROI immediately. Uh, but that's lower than the one drop rake was. And I think that the value of this tournament's higher than that. So for monster buying tournaments, this is the best tournament of all time. 
Um, now, you know, if you're talking just straight ROI, clearly like a giant main event is going to be a way higher ROI. But for your hourly and for money earned, yeah, this is one of the best tournaments I've ever played. There's no doubt about it. So the way that you would uh, calculate that is you would you would have to guesstimate how much people are losing, you know. So you would have to kind of have a ranking system of percents of ROIs um, of how many people are losing um, compared to the ROIs of the winners minus the rake. And and, um, and that's kind of how you get that the value, you know. So it's like uh, the elite pros that play a lot of tournaments are, are making a, a lot, a lot of money in this tournament a lot of money that's for sure okay yeah that's all right makes makes sense it's just it is it's all it's uh it's unique all around and 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 discuss a little bit about the the format in terms of six hours or is that true six levels the pros are separated so if there's 40 25 or let's say there's uh what i make it easy 50 people register 25 25 they would break it into all the pros play together, all the non-pros play until what level and explain what that means in terms of the dynamic. So for the first six levels of the tournament, all the pros are going to play each other and all the amateurs are going to play each other. So it, it's, it's kind of wild. Um, on top of that, you're not allowed to play at the same table as your amateur until the final table. So that's kind of a funny dynamic too, because like, say your amateur is a very good poker player. Say your amateur is Paul, you know, well, Tom's got it pretty good because he doesn't have to sit with Paul at once the tables do converge. So that's one less good player that he he knows he's going to avoid, you know. Right. So it's kind of it's kind of funny in that way. Like if you have the weakest amateur, it's kind of a bummer that they invited you because you don't get to play with them once the uh, once the tables come together. Um, but yeah, so the first six hours you're playing against all the superstars if you're a pro. And that should be some fun TV, but at the same time, it is an interesting, um, it's an interesting element. You know, I I worry, hopefully people don't stall, you know, I know a couple of the guys that are playing this thing are kind of habitual stallers in the regular tour. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully they don't show up and, and start taking four minutes a hand just because, you know, they're waiting to get to level six. Like we all are, or Mm -hmm. waiting to finish level six. Um, is it there is yeah, a shot it, it clock was, I'd imagine or or maybe not maybe just or if not probably with uh, it within reason though if anyone it's a, it's everyone's pretty yeah it would keep each other in line I'm sure not going to let that go even though it's kind of weird right because it's like yeah. you wouldn't want to see it but if there was ever a time where you wouldn't mind someone taking an extra 30 seconds might be this but of course you don't want to abuse it or make yeah. it ridiculous and, and and take take the yeah piss. this is a special tournament so I mean you know like obviously if I you know if no one if nothing mattered everybody would sit around and stall, but I'm showing up and I'm playing as fast as I play any other day. Yeah. And I'm playing the, you know, because it's, it's a special event and I'm there to respect the event. You know, I think it's really great how, you know, there's no sunglasses or scarves or hoodies. People really can't hide anymore. And that really benefits, you know, like guys that play a lot of live poker and that are very comfortable. Um, I think, the, and then the people that really hide behind stuff, I think it is an interesting dynamic. There are a lot of pros that, really don't like to play in a t-shirt or don't like to play with their eyeballs exposed and is that and is that a rule here there's no the, scarves hoodies or, or or sunglasses no scarves hoodies or sunglasses wow sunglasses. i didn't see that i know um, that's been a big debate rob young who we both are well know very well with being representing party poker has put out some some polls on that on sunglasses and scarves and there's been some some interesting uh, debate and really mixing it up with the, the overall um you know what party poker is doing so where, how, where do you stand on that? You like, I mean, I see, I know you're, you're like a t-shirt, you know, raw, like ready to go. You'd go no shirt if you could, but what, yeah. how, how do you feel on all that? Are you, do you think it's okay? Or are yeah. you like, you like to see it gone? You know, honestly, I'm, I'm, as long as it's not like an extreme thing where you're scaring off people. Like I love Christoph. He's the nicest guy in the world. He's, right. he's a really great poker player and he's a good dude, but I think he takes it a little too far with the turtle hoodie thing. Yeah. Um, like one time I was playing a sit and go with Christoph. Like a, we were playing like a 300k Hong Kong sit and go with a couple like friendly Chinese dudes who kind of wanted to gamble before dinner, and uh, <laughs> and I look over and Christoph's in the middle of the pot with his turtle hoodie up and his blue sharks on, and I'm just like Christoph, bro, we're playing a sit and go with friends. Take it easy, man. Yeah, that's uh, uh, but that's, I get it. I mean, that's that's. Man, ex- exactly. It's I, he is a very nice guy from what I what I when I've interacted with oh, him he is. and what. 
it's, he is, yeah. He gets a tough, he gets a tough brood of it. He's sort of the poster boy for what not to do. But if you do think about it, it is kind of, it's yeah. a little tilting, but it's also, yeah, it's like, uh, if you're, if you're like a wreck or someone coming for the first time, you're, you're going to be just kind of like, you're going to be a little turned off. So I think that's, yeah, a, I mean, he's already so good and so dominant has a reputation for being that good that it's like terrifies people. So I think like once you take it to that element, it, it gets a little bit extreme. Um, but beyond that, you know, it's like I think people should have – people could do whatever they want up to a certain level. You know, I think the face mask and this and that are just probably shouldn't be around. But, you know, I don't really mind a guy, like, wearing a fashionable scarf and playing if he doesn't want people to see his neck. I think it's like as long as you don't look like you're going out of your way to hide yourself, it's whatever. It's all opinion. Uh, each, each person's opinion. And mine is like – I don't think it really hurts anything until you start looking like you're a Ninja Turtle or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. And and just on topic a little bit about with Party Poker and being one of the, the brand ambassadors, you know, we both are representing Party who's making a lot of changes, doing a lot. Rob Young really mixing it up, taking some chances on some big issues. Where, where do you stand uh, with in regards to being online poker background for so long as well with the HUDs, no no HUDs, which is the heads-up displays, you know, all those matrix numbers if you're not familiar with it, if you're ever watching on Twitch or YouTube or see people online, they have uh, all the numbers which can look pretty intimidating. Where do you, How do you feel about the new alias names as well as the HUDs and the hand replayer sort of uh, hand history uh, switch? I, I know you probably haven't been playing too much online lately, but those are those are major issues and I know you've been briefed and your opinions always asked when these type of things are going on um you know and, and big changes in the industry uh wh where do you stand with that how do you feel on those issues yeah i think it's pretty complicated because um i know our friend phil galfon does the same thing on run at once poker uh with anonymous names and no huds and um those guys have put a lot of thought and so so has rob put a lot of thought into taking care of the player and making it more difficult for people to cheat and have better um, bot analysis and this and that. So I think they're on to something for sure. I think it is less intimidating for players to know they're not being hunted. Um, like like you you are if your name's available, you, you know, especially the seating scripts and things, the way they work, like a player sits at a table and it instantly fills because all these bot seating scripts sit people there so they can shark this fish out. So it's nice to take that element away. There is always the concern that people can't identify that they're playing bots or being colluded against because they don't know who like how to identify a person so there's that concern so i think there really needs to be an increase in security and um features to find bots because the players are a little um a little more or a little less aware of what's happening around them because they don't know the person's name. So I think there are pros and cons to it. Overall, I think I'm for it. Uh, I think it's pretty cool how at high stakes they're trying to have people's uh, actual names too. That's a pretty cool little feature that Party's going to do. And I think Phil may eventually do that when he runs high stakes as well. Is kind of like, hey, if we're all playing this really tiny player pool, um, then knowing each, each person, uh, since it's kind of a personal thing, is a little different. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned... Um, run it once as well, Phil Galfine, and I know you've you've been involved with them and one of the coaches, I believe. If you still, I know you've done a lot of content and you that that site is one of the the great training sites. It's been around for a long time. Um, to, how, how has that been? You can you explain a little bit? You do coaching still, or you did, or you? I know you do videos, and you're one of the run it once <coughs> sort of ambassadors as well. Um, how has that process been, and how did how long have you been doing that, and and how has that changed maybe over time with your involvement? Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Like pre Black Friday, uh, I whenever I met Phil, um, you know, I was a huge fanboy. I watched all of his training videos coming up through the ranks, and they asked me to make videos. And I was kind of like a mid tier pro on the site, and really excited to be a part of it. And throughout the way, as my career has pro progressed, I've always kept that in mind. I, I don't coach anymore because I just don't have the time. And coaching to me is a really intense immersive thing where i go all in on it like if i'm gonna coach i want to be the best coach i possibly can so it ends up being a very personal experience for me and i feel committed so if i can't give that product to my students uh i just decided not to coach anymore so i don't offer to coach anymore 
and I'll still make run at once uh, content. I haven't made any content recently because I've been so damn busy, but I'll always make videos for them as a thank you for believing in me in 2010. That's that's great. Yeah, I would I I have to say it's the same thing for coaching. I get asked for, for to do coaching and it's it is it's like it's also you look at the best players in the world doesn't mean they're going to be a great coach necessarily or maybe someone that's like an okay player could be a great coach so i think that's an important point to hit on and and again it's like you could charge i, I just give me a, give it give an idea of how like at the elite level what your hourly would be because i think that's what i try to tell people is whether it's run at once raise your edge you know doug has a training program there's fedor came out with one so there is information out there from some of the elite there's elite ways to get information, but if you, if you're paying what your hourly would be, or what you know, I would what the hourlies of like top players would be. Really, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go over a hand history or two. Not not to say it's wrong, and some people want just the experience. Like maybe they just want to hang out with you or me and talk, right? And talk little poker and whatever. But if you want to spend, if you're gonna go to run it once or one of these other programs. You're gonna be able to spend for what money you're spending there, which some people might say, "Oh, it's kind of expensive." But like, just give give a perspective. Like, just throw out a random number if you had to say, like, someone said to you, and you really were like, "You know what? I'll do it." But just like you're transparent. Hey, this isn't gonna be my best. This isn't gonna be like I can't make you. You, you just want to spend an hour, look at a hand, or talk, or I'll give you some tips. Give an idea of what your hourly would be if you had to do it, because I like you said, you're so busy. It's almost like not what you'd want to do. But like, what would that take? Just to give an idea and why um, maybe doing a run at once or another program is so much more valuable because you get at your own time dispersal from other great players to go through and study. So just give an idea what that would cost if you had to throw a number out without uh, like. I mean, last month I, I turned down um, a lot of hours with a person at 4000 an hour. So there you go, guys. Look at that. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's when you look at one of these run at once or programs where you spend maybe a thousand for like a whole course or what's run at once, like a hundred a month or 120 a month. You're talking. I think so yeah. So I it's like, look, you could get Jason, and if you have the money, it's great. Or you want to spend. You know, I, I, I same thing. I, I'd rather do an hour on Twitch or an hour on YouTube or an hour of a podcast where can kind of do a lot of value and do a lot of things versus one hour with one person where I don't even think it's the best served value so there you go i mean if you so that four thousand you could be a run at once for life almost or for years and and probably you get hundreds of hours so just to give you an idea that the level of uh what it costs and yeah look at uh, nick nicholas bennett burnett in the chat saying holy shit so i mean that's higher than i would have thought but that, i thought it'd be really high and that that makes sense so and that it's just really about your time you're talking about playing million dollar tournaments hundred thousand dollars you're playing cash games so you got to look at what is your actual time worth well, it's, too it's not just that either there it's it's like when you when you're a coach now you're dialed into not only the teaching a person you're also there for them on whatsapp all the time you're there for them on talking about like every element of the game it's not just hey this is how you play this hand or this flop or this is what your three betting range is it's okay what's your table look like all right let's talk about seat nine let's talk about this and that okay it's all right you took a bad beat keep your head up you know so it's energy it's more it's more time that like I don't mind doing. I, I'm fully committed to it if I want to do it, but I know I can't do it anymore. Exactly. So no, it's, and on top of that, like the person that approached me uh, recently, they would get the same value out of a mid stakes player coaching them for two hundred dollars an hour um, for the you know the next year or whatever. I don't think you should look for an elite coach until you're just underneath of an elite player. You yeah. Because you're going to learn the same stuff from a mid stakes player. That's that's uh, it's that's exactly right. That's funny. Someone in the chat saying 4K. I thought it would be higher to be honest. Yeah, I mean, again, like you said, a lot comes with it. You're talking about time, access. It's already hard to keep up with doing the social stuff, keeping up with friends. This and then you add in someone where, like you said, it's not just that hour. There is there's other stuff that comes with it, and you want to do your best. So that that makes a lot of sense. Um, man, are we got? There's so many questions, um, maybe the record even, or one of them. So we, I want to make sure we spend a little time on that. I want to real quickly just run over, talk about the the Power Fest going on because, you know, with Party Poker, is that something, are you going to be able to play at all? Or that it basically overlaps Triton, but would you play, let's say, the 20, like on the end of it after Triton, are you going to try to play online a little bit, like the last day on the 11th or, you know, towards the end, is that something you would you would potentially play or is that just not even in the, like, is that something you have your eye on or, or you just don't even really look at? Every chance I get to play on party, I will. I, I last, um, maybe 
in the beginning of the year, I had two days where I played uh, two two dollar or five dollar ante on uh, with short deck on party. So if I get a chance to play, I certainly will, and I'll play. You know, I'll play anything that's like one k or higher, even just. Um, I really look forward to them. They say they were going to open up Trickets Room again, so I'll play some. Hopefully, Sam will let me play some of their games. Um, so I'll play in there. But um, I know me personally, this stop, I, some of the tournaments are going to stop, but the cash games aren't in London. So I'll probably be busy a lot longer than most of the tournament players. If if I have a free day, I'll certainly play. Um, okay, well, there you go. Yeah, I was trying to put it on the screen. It was backwards. It's really, it's kind of strange. So like, I hope you saw the lobby, guys. PowerFest, 28 million guarantees. It's, uh, I got some very, very big events coming. A new new replayer on Party Poker as well. Some software upgrades, name changes, the aliases, and no HUD. So if that intimidates you, Party Poker no longer will have those those uh, numbers running on for HUD. So it's kind of cool. Brand new, sort of a open canvas for you guys. Um, speaking of the cash games in London Triton, you were involved in the largest cash pot. I bu- so correct me if I'm wrong. At the moment, you lost the largest cash game in the history of televised poker, which was uh, a, a pretty sick hand with Kane Callis, who turned top set of tens. You rivered ace queen. You shoved. You, you got snap called. You knew you were not good. But then I believe you won maybe then the biggest pot ever as well. Right after that, or close to it, at least. Like, can, can you talk maybe? about was is it is that the biggest you won the is it the top two you were involved in or the one and maybe at the time i don't know but it was some of the biggest pots ever talk about those two they hands if you will. they were certainly up there just because the stakes was it was the biggest stakes cash game that was maybe ever televised you know so it wasn't like as it sounds a lot cooler than what it was but really at the end of the day i wasn't even all in for that many big blinds like i think the first pot i started maybe 120 big blinds deep and the second pot Maybe we were 160, 170 big blinds deep, but um, you know, there's a lot of clickbaity stuff in there. I, uh, I certainly, um, they were big pots, and they might have been the biggest ever televised. But um, the stakes were gigantic, and I, I found myself in a couple spots where I was betting a no- very normal amount, but the the fact that we were playing 5k, 10k euro or whatever we were playing, it made made it look a lot more intense than you know. Right, well, that, that's interesting too. So it is, yeah. It's 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 huge, but in the in the moment or in the actual the the breadth of it, it's sort of yeah. It wasn't like the craziest like ten thousand, you know, five thousand big blinds or something. It was pretty standard. Just it's it's pretty pretty insane. How how do you prepare? How do you feel in terms of cash game versus tournaments? Is it do you do any different preparation or what? What is uh? How does your mindset? You know, because it is it's rare to have to play people that play big cash or big tournaments too because it, it's a different game of course with different stack sizes and tournaments being cash game deep stacked is that is that something do you look forward to cash you're a tournament guy would you would call yourself i would assume but you play cash as well or do you how do you break down your your overall um you say 50 50 70 30 and, and how do you sort of uh look at both approach those differently and, and which one do you maybe enjoy more actually they're very different beasts. Tournaments are much more complicated um, just because you there are so many different elements to tournaments. Uh, things change so often. Playing stack sizes and ranges are so um, dynamic. Everything's just completely extreme. And then the second you start dealing with ICM, now you're not playing chip EV, so your strategy completely changes again. So you have like so many different elements and stack sizes and, and dynamics that you don't have. And like specifically this the cash games I've been playing the past few years have been like short deck where there's a, an amount that you can take off. So once you reach a certain amount of antes, you can take off. So the game kind of stays within a, an abstraction that you're pretty comfortable with. Um, so th- the preparation is very different for tournaments because you don't study the same thing over and over and over again. You constantly have to do your best to be pretty good at heads it up pretty good at four-handed, pretty good at playing bubbles, pretty good at playing 200 big blinds deep and 100 big blinds deep and 40 and 30 and 20 and understanding how all those ranges change. So tournaments are very hard to prepare for because they're so different. Um, That said, cash games are, you know, they can be more lethal uh, because you can, there's, you never know how much you could win or lose in a night. So um, especially if you're playing short deck. Um, I really love them both. Uh, and talking about you mentioned short deck because I know again, man, you're gonna 
you're gonna have to be one of those repeat we got to have uh, multiple we're gonna have to do this again in the future because i do want to get to the questions and there's like four things i'm thinking that i haven't even thought of yet or talking about but t tell me about short deck quickly because short deck is it's so it's burst on the scene triton's uh um popularized it you've won some of the you actually made your biggest score when you won i think two or you won a, over three million in a short deck event at one of the triton maybe you even won two in one series uh how, how is a short deck i mean is this something that is is uh do you feel is it now the new plo is it is it it's becoming so popular um talk to us a little about what short deck is and why do you think you've got it's what seems to be a knack for it is is there is there any give us a little bit of uh info on short deck and and, and this is now a big part of the triton series there's eight events or whatnot i believe half or roughly are short deck events i know it's very popular in asia uh talk to me a little about short deck and what that means for you and and, and your overall feeling on that too so short deck is normal hold'em without the fives through the deuces in the deck and flushes beat full houses because they happen so rarely. Um, so a six, seven, eight, nine is the wheel. And basically just in a nutshell, there are no bricks in the game. So it is similar to PLO how you're, you bluff with a lot of equity. It's not like no limit hold'em where you get to be polar and you're just like, you have a bullshit hand and you bluff the river with it. That doesn't happen very often in short deck. So since the equity is run closer together, um, the variance is much higher and the losing players win a lot more frequently than they win in normal no limit hold them against the best players. So it's good because your win rate could be equivalent to what your win rate would be in normal no limit and hold them. But since the variance is so high, the fish go home happy a little more often and uh, it keeps the game running a bit longer, you know, and there's crazy heaters and crazy downswings. So it's pretty hard sometimes to tell who's winning and who isn't. Um, so that like short term luck based variant of the game is very good for it, but it's also very bad for some people's sanity. Um, it's a really fun game. There's tons of action. There's lots of limping and lots of multi way pots. It's really hard. And it actually ended up becoming a really great tournament game, too, because the uh, ICM effects in short deck are so, so extreme um, because the equities run so close together. And uh, unlike PLO, you know, there's a bunch of antis laying out there. And it's also no limit. So uh, it's just a really, really extreme take on Hold'em. And it's, it's a lot of fun to play. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about it. I, I know some very basic um, principles of it. And it's going to be fun to, to watch if, and, and go over there. And, and I do want to just just circle back here before we go take a bunch of some questions here because i know you got to run to your you got one of your two a day sessions going so let's uh just kind of pop over to the to the hen and mob just sort of run through memory lane quickly so in two dot you did say you went into sort of the matrix right and there's been times where you just disconnected and you said all right i'm taking off from live poker until i come back and, and i think that's a really powerful thing and i think a lot of poker players that that's a very tough concept to say all right you know maybe things aren't going so well or i need to readjust some things or i just need to step back and, and evaluate so you know looking here um just kind of talking about that time frame it looks like the let's see 2000 i remember this one you actually knocked me out of this the the one the 100k and alpha 8 st kitts actually in a hand we talked i remember i think with 10s to ace 10 suited we actually talked after you gave me a different way to look at that hand was interesting um and then in the the 125k uh what was that the the premier league i think we also played together um, that was November 2013 and you final tabled that as well, but that was a, that was a fun format. I hope they bring that back the premier league. That's a really cool thing. But then it was, seems like right after that, was that when you sort of, was it 2013 or early 2014? When did you go into, to hide into sort of hibernation and, and reshifted your game? When was the break or, um, your step back? So the hibernation was the spring and summer of 2013. Oh, 2013. The, yeah, and then 2014, the beginning of 2014, uh, that's when Bianca and I got together, and uh, the heater began. The life heater, the happiness heater, the poker heater. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, the one yeah. that stands out for me was the LAPC. I think in that that 436K score, I remember seeing it. I'm like March 2015 even, because, uh, yeah, 2014 looks like you kind of did – at least on oh, I'm getting my years. I'm getting my years backwards. Sorry, twenty. The spring and summer of 2014, I went into hibernation. Okay, 2015 is the year Bianca and I got together. Yeah, so so they all blur together. That makes yeah, that makes sense because that looks like I remember that specifically. I remember you taking first in this event, and then I kind of and then I just remember. 
all of a sudden you won the hard rock too, which is like, you know, that 5k, I think your buddy, good friend of yours, Seth Davies, one of your close friends got second. You went one, two and looks like was what was, a uh, uh were you guys already really close then, or is that when you kind of got to know each other better? Super that, close. He was, he was my student. Wow. So I mean, that's pretty, dude. That's crazy. Eight hundred forty-seven people. You get to go one, two. I mean, that's one of those probably stand out, right? That's like as good as it gets. And and five K buy-in, the ROI is crazy. Uh, your your student gets second, and I've seen him a lot on the high roller um, circuits and doing well and and battling the, and the stuff. Seems like really really nice guy, motivated person so so you go on this heater you hit that score that's a special one too because even though it's a million the roi off of 5k it's, it's it's just unbelievable and then from there it's just been kind of crazy you're hitting 1 million scores playing everything that we're looking for let's fast forward here just because for time's sake and then i mean this last this last year this was that hong kong one that's a three million that was short deck uh annie only one million you you got 3.6 million that's your largest score as well i believe which it's also impressive you have 20 Basically 29 million in scores, and you don't, you know, not taking away from some of these other guys, Antonio, Bonomo, Fedor. These guys have like a 10 million, 14, 16 million score. You have your biggest score is 3.6, and you have 29. I think that's like, to me, that's the most impressive. It just shows how consistent, and how many different scores of that nature have happened. So, I mean, that's closing on 30 million. Your number eight all-time money list. That's pretty crazy, man. I mean, it really is impressive, and and just seeing these scores of late. Um, it, it just seems like you really have just sort of ignited here um, in some of these Triton and short deck as well uh, tournaments. So it, it's exciting, and it does seem like you're just you're really peaking and, and at the right times, uh, right times here. So yeah, man, just want to make sure everyone sees that this is like this is really the testament of someone that puts in the work, puts in the dedication, and and things just kind of happen. And again, it is uh, that's cool, man. That's really cool to see that I didn't even realize that. That's uh, that shows like there's. It seems almost impossible. How do you have twenty nine and three point six your largest? I'm trying to scroll through here. There's a lot of a lot of know, twos, a lot of threes. Been a long road, man. Yeah. Long what? Road. Talk, this has been. This is going to answer a bunch of questions for goal setting. Um, the, the, uh, in terms, of, I've seen people ask about goals. Do you look at that? Does this motivate you? Do you have? A, I want to be number one all time. Is it just sort of? Uh, do you take everything in stride every tournament? Do you not really look at that? I mean, of course, it's great to have benchmarks and, and parameters and, and ways to analyze and, and and measure your game. But what what to you would be a successful career? And, and in terms of maybe goals in poker, is there stuff that you still want to? Is there something like oh, I want to win the main event? I want to do this. Is there anything in particular that you would be you really want to stamp on your career? That looking at it now and looking forward. Um, no, I think the getting through the um, those moments where I felt like defeated and felt like I, I was I was going to walk away from the game and stepping through that and and pushing myself to play at a higher level. I think that that's what I that was my main goal, and then. Um, having financial independence for my family and myself, which I, I achieved a, a, quite a while ago. And um, the earnings don't mean anything to me at all. The rankings, the, the bracelets, none of that stuff means anything to me. Um, they, they would be nice treats, um, but uh, I'm just doing my best to play when I want to play, when I'm excited to play, do the right things in between those times. And... Um, yeah, just really enjoy it and really enjoy the, the freedom that this lifestyle has and enjoy the discipline of working hard and just, yeah, just being excited to be here and, and, and being consistent. You know, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not playing the game. So I like, you know, me, I'm not trying to have a brand, you know, I'm one of these guys, that's kind of like bouncing around on TV. I've never have been, I've never, I've always accepted the fact that I wasn't probably wasn't going to be like one of these big stars. And, and that was okay with me. And actually it's year after year that, I, I prefer that. I prefer to just kind of show up and, and put in the work and try to improve the lives of the people around me and, and be proud of, of what I've done. And I, I, I've achieved that. That's awesome. Yeah, man. No, you definitely, you definitely have. I do want to remind everyone there is a, there's a retweet for Party Poker giving away a $55 Power Fest ticket. So we're going to do that at the very end here. I'm going to make sure we take some questions because there's so many 
ridiculously good ones. And again, Jason, hopefully we would get be able to have back on if uh, he is willing later. Maybe after, you know, it's going to be soon after a week if you have the you win the Triton, you know, million. Maybe we'll do a little something different. But uh, it, it's 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 very it's special. Be interesting either way. You can talk about the win or you can talk about how sad it was to lose so much. Well, the, yeah, no, like I said, I would love it. We got <laughs> there's a lot to talk about. I already know I'm missing a ton before the last thing I want to talk about um before we do take some questions and i know you have to zoom off here um is burning man because I, that was for me honestly looking back was probably the most fun i ever had in my life and you were a big part of that me you antonio um tabby like and we were sharing an rv having the greatest time i mean it was just my fr- it was our it was the first time at burning man as well i've gone three times now i think yeah. i know one the first two years the 14 2014 and 2015 we were there together 2014 we spent the majority of the week together, um, which was just epic. And then I ended up meeting my wife that one of the nights there, right at the end. I, I was there. When you were, you yes, you were there. Um, it was, it was incredible. It was powerful. That was like really bonding and fun, man. That was, that's like the greatest memory I have, um, with you and just, and just a lot of fun, but tell me a little bit about burn. I guess, you know, I don't want to say specifically burning man, but maybe talk a little about what that means for you in terms of letting loose or being able to disconnect. Cause for me, that's what that represents. Just like, it's so hard really with poker and all this stuff going on and just being around and, and disconnecting. What do you kind of do for, for disconnecting? And are you a burner now? Like how many years have you gone Two, two or three or four now? How many? I, I've gone three. I've gone three. Okay. I, um, I love Burning Man. I think it's amazing. I haven't been able to make it in the last three years just because I've been really busy and I can't make it this year because Seth is actually getting married. So I have to go to Mexico to his wedding. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, yeah, no, Burning Man's an amazing place. It's a good place to go kind of just let loose. And yeah, I think we was 2014, 15, 16. That, that's when I went. Maybe that's the exact same for you. I haven't gone the last. This will be the third year in a row not going. But I more not, not specifically Burning Man, which obviously is a lot of fun. It was great. But what, uh, what do you do? What is your sort of... What do you do to relax when you're just like, all right, I need to disconnect, take off a week or a couple of days? Do you have a special, is there a spot in the world you like to go or type of place? I know you're a nature guy, you do hikes, you're very athletic, outdoorsy. Is there anything in particular that you do to just sort of decompress or if you want to just take get away, where do you and Bianca go or kind of spot or, or, or type of places? The thing is, we're always kind of at a getaway, so it's just really nice to be home sitting on the couch, uh, not looking at the phone, watching some Netflix sometimes, you know? It just feels yeah. good. Or and we, and we home for you now, is that you were in Vancouver, now life. Vegas, or you, you split time, or where where generally? <clears throat> much much more in uh, Vegas, I have a place in Vancouver, but we spend much, much more time in Vegas now because I, I just uh, haven't had time to play online, and online's been quite small. Um, so a lot more of my efforts have been in life the live area the last few years um but yeah I, i'm an outdoorsman i really like to fish I, I was raised like around lakes and i fished a ton as a kid so i like to get back to that and just any chance i get to hang out and, and talk with um old friends is great awesome well guys i know jason we already we're already gonna not pro we're not gonna be able to get to all these he's got to run here he has a scheduled um some coaching he is gearing up for the largest poker term in the history the one million pound triton series uh, main main event. I mean, it's just it's. I guess it's a charity event. There's another main event, but it's it, it's a featured event. Jason will be participating, partnered with legend Bobby Baldwin. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. But let's try to knock out a few questions. Then Jason, I know you do have to go. So let's just kind of maybe try to rapid fire some of these as much as we can. And again, we'll invite Jason back and hopefully have him again in the near future. Um, all right. So let's just again. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of read these and. and rapid fire slash uh, you can we can skip any of them first one here on the top is why is everyone hiding how much they have in the turn uh, percent in the tourney how much you have in this one mil i mean that's a personal question guys but I, I just maybe talk about in a million pound type buy-in what's like a typical what would be the range you would say for pros like you know it's not yours specifically but give me like a, a, a like a bottom end of someone you might know not not naming anyone but like what would be like the low and high pros might take of themselves or swap because they're swapping there's pieces there's all kinds of stuff so how would you kind of tackle that and just to give a little bit of a inside look without giving specifics what kind of ranges and how it works yeah so so one perk to this tournament is is a lot of the you know the amateurs know that they are underdogs to the best players so they get to invite a best player and in return they get to buy a big piece of their package which makes them lose less or even potentially win some money for themselves so it works out well because 
the amateurs that are putting up so much or if not all of their own money, um, they get a little rebate that way. And almost no pro is going to put up 1.25 million um, uh, to play the tournament. But the the notion that these high stakes pros don't have huge pieces of themselves is is really something that I think like. Home Youth or Mattisal said on some TV show how these pros are passing the money around and how they they don't take big pieces themselves inside. It's quite silly. Um, the I I'd say the average pro in this tournament has at least twenty five percent of themselves, and some of them have a lot more than that. Right. All right. So that yeah, that give I, I agree. I think that this sort of got tossed around, or there's some swapping, or this or that, and people sort of downgrade, diminish what is maybe the case or not. Even ever, if there is swapping. Even if there is swapping, which there is, you know, there has to be to reduce variance, you're still risking that amount of money. Exactly. Like, it's not like swap, like if you both bust, you're out, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I think it's a good point. I think somewhere along the way it got kind of twisted in and everyone just sort of, it's sometimes, not that it even matters, because even at 10, 20%, whatever, it's still, a, it's huge tournament, huge stakes, but... Yeah. Okay. That that's a good answer. I think that gives people a good idea that you know. And again, some people may have a lot more. It just it's just a wide range, um, and everyone's unique, right? You don't really know what someone's business is or what in a certain spot take a bigger chance or not like this. Um, uh, so someone's asked, did you ever think you'd become a high stakes player? Like wh when you were first starting, did this did this cross your mind? This wasn't really a thing like high roller circuit and stuff necessarily back then for tournaments. But when did you did you believe that? Like when did you think that was gonna. That was like a real possibility. I remember watching Rail Heaven, uh, which was this table on full tilt where people played five hundred one thousand against each other all the time, and I remember being enamored by it and wondering if I would ever get there. But in the beginning, I was just happy to make some money to to buy stupid stuff with. To be honest. Um, okay. What do you think about the party poker changes? We did cover this guys earlier. Jason did speak on, on this, so you can go back. Um, let's see. Do you prefer short deck or regular? No limit. Hold them. You got to choose one. What do you like? My true love will always be no limit. Hold them. But for making the most money in today's poker sphere, uh, I'd say short deck is higher. Earn. Okay. Is there anything that bothers you and affects your game in poker? Is there anything that kind of that annoys you at a table or or just in general, is there stuff that, that this is from Ivan Sandoval, Sandoval. Do you believe, like, is there anything that sort of irritates you within poker? Certainly. Yeah. People that are mean to dealers really bother me. Um, it's really hard. So, you don't experience this nearly as much once you play with the same people in the smallest groups because they just get weeded out, but it is difficult sometimes to play large field tournaments. And some people are just pretty obnoxious and quite mean to people and, whatever, too starey or whatever it is they're doing. They're just, uh, you know, they, they haven't played enough iterations yet for someone to punish them enough to stop doing it. And some people, I guess, just like doing that to people. But just any kind of element of people being rude, uh, I, I can't stand. Okay. Yeah, definitely a line there. So this is an interesting question from Garan's Luck. What is your biggest tip for transitioning from online to live tournament play? What would you say would be something that you would just like you could really say to someone, you know what, this is important, or I learned, or this is what I would recommend, or looking back, give us your best tip for making the transition. Your sensations and the things that you like need to adapt to, you can fix at the lowest stakes. So just going to a casino, even if, say, you're like a pretty high stakes online player, and playing like a couple weeks of one, two, no limit, and just getting the feel for the way that you know, the certain um, rules that, that apply in, in poker, like putting out X amount of chips as a raise or saying this or doing that or, or sitting there and feeling the physical sensations in your body, you'll feel exactly the same no matter how high you play. So just play lower and get a feel for it that way. Okay. Football or American football? Both fantastic sports. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I play both in high school. So, um, I was much better at American football. Um, so for me personally, I would have taken that, but to spectate, I think they're both wonderful. Yeah. It's a, it's good. It's a good, uh, London's a good spot, man. It's a very, very, uh, strong, uh, football community, um, European football, um, live or online. If you had to choose one to play, like you could only play. so hard um the best the best like moments for sure live 
but like if I had to play every day for a year straight, probably online. And uh, question: Do you still have the same passion for the game as when you started? I do. Yeah, it it burns inside of me, and when that passion leaves, uh, you will you won't see me around as often. Um, what's your most memorable thing outside of the poker world? What's like a great memory for you outside of poker? We've got a lot of really good ones, man. Um, just like, just memories with uh, my my family, my friends, and my fiance. Just just moments where whatever you just sit around and everyone's having a great moment together, and you have so much appreciation for existing. Moments like that are the most important to me. Awesome. Um, all right, I know, guys. Jason does have a tight. T- let me know if we have time for a couple more. You got to run here real quick, right? We just have a quick giveaway to do. You, you gotta- go ahead. You can fire. You can fire a couple for sure. Okay. Uh, biggest online score. What's your biggest score online ever? I chopped a. It was a three hundred dollar buy in tournament that had thirteen thousand five hundred people in it. I chopped it heads up for just under five hundred thousand. And who was that? A buddy of yours or someone you knew that was very good or just? Uh, at the time, he was a very good. Uh, I remember him being a very good regular, uh, but I can't. I can't remember his, who it, who it was. It was nice. A long time ago, man. Okay, that's a nice. Yeah, it's a nice score. Um, does your social life suffer when you play poker? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, you know, especially if you play a lot of live poker, you're kind of burnt out on being social. So, it's. Uh, all your desire to be social with people that you actually care about kind of goes away because you just need downtime to have some silence. Yep, that's for sure. Who is the funniest poker player? The funniest. Like, who do you enjoy, like, at the table? Talks a lot. Nick, maybe you're just Nick ma- Petrangelo, probably. Nick Petrangelo is outrageously funny. He's, like, ridiculous. And he he's playing, I think, right? Is he on this list? Yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's playing. He's a tough cookie, that's for sure. Uh, someone asking, are you married and do you have kids? So we know the answer. You're not married, but you are with your – it's Bianca's is your high school sweet, sweetheart. Is that correct? Or even before? How long? No, you... but we we were college teammates. College. Track team, but, Col- we, but we were just friends. She was just like this really, really hot girl in college that I always looked at in her track outfit. But we didn't get <laughs> together until way after – way after college but oh but you so you knew you were friendly and you knew each other in college but that was yeah we were friends yeah we were both sprinters that's awesome um man so that's a that's a that's a what so 10 year plus what 30 10 12 15 even you know her since what we met we met in 2007 yeah so okay wow long Twelve. time so no kids though what about what are your thoughts on kids i do remember i think i saw you make us said something about right now you want to travel enjoy the most you can because you don't know if, how that'll be after but your kids is in the future is that something you're very oh yeah yeah, yeah. get married in october in big sur california and hopefully next year start start trying but see how it goes all right um do you uh oh, someone asking do you play a lot on party poker uh, oh, when I play online, I play a ton of party poker, but I haven't had as much time to play online. Okay. Have you ever been on a staking deal? If so, what was the decision based on? If not, what factors would affect your decision? I'm curious for myself if I should seek backing or take it full to take it full time. Currently, have a full time job. I'm winning low stakes, lo, winning micro slash low stakes. Uh, there's a quote from Naval Ravikant that he says, uh, "You'll never." get wealthy renting out your time so if you have the ability to be on your own role on a game that you have a high win rate at you certainly should take all your own action that being said most staking deals are more lucrative for the stakey than they are the staker uh these are kind of like old school rounders style 50 50 with makeup deals are way way better for the person who's being backed Uh, they have no exposure to risk and um, on top of that, when they do happen to have a big bank, they, they have a massive win. So there are a ton of staking deals that go really well for people. Um, but, you know, my opinion is if you have a chance to have a lot of skin in the game, you should. I think it's um, I think it's better for both parties. Yeah, I, w- I would say just the experience of being doing both um, both sides of it, too. It's I think it like that that. That statement about having skin in the game is so important, whether you, I think just for you personally playing, but also for, um, 
for you pl to play and have a piece of it, but also if you're going to stake someone, make sure they have something, whether even if it's something relatively small, like it just matters, I think in general, right? They just, so they, they got to put up some of the money and, and be tied in. I think just for overall mental side of it makes a lot of sense that, that, yeah. Yeah. Ben Solsky made a video on staking on Reddit once. And if you're actually very interested in being staked or backing people, you should listen to it. It's a much uh, more sound theoretical perspective to backing people and I'll answer a lot of your questions. All right. That's great. Yeah. So check that out, guys. That 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 sounds like a good place to get some more information on that. Um, and it says in your blog, you said top players act like they don't care and seem this is a question from Duck Dodgers. So it's basically saying that in, in a blog you wrote that you mentioned top players act like they don't care and seem emotionless about the win or loss, but you don't just decide that and it happens. And they saying, so how do you come to that? Is it easy to say just detach yourself? But when you have a downswing, you know, you get a bit emotional. So I just want to, I think we did cover this some, but um, maybe just reference that in that blog, what you're talking about and, and how you're able to maybe detach. Do you have any tricks to sort of move on from some, something like that or get through it in a tough spot? It's not fun to lose, of course. Yeah, I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of like the high stakes guys are actually much better than me at this. I think that I give a lot of advice and I'm happy to do that. But at the same time, I'm guilty of a lot of the things I'm advising not to do, you know, so I don't want to be a hypocrite here. I'll go ahead and admit like if I'm really, really exhausted and beat down and losing, uh, I sense like uh, weakness in, in myself, like I'll be grumpy to people or I'll um, sometimes I'll feel like my ego trying to like, like I'll try to, Hey guys, like I'm still, you know, I'm still good. Like this and that, like, like I would obviously wouldn't say that at a table, but I feel like, like I do little subtle, like kind of douchey things sometimes. So whenever, whenever I'm losing or getting crushed and it's something that I'm constantly working on. So definitely take the advice of, you know, working on, um, always having gratitude and, feeling physical sensations inside your body and observing them and moving on. But, but don't beat yourself up if it's a process. I know for me personally, uh, emotional things have always been kind of something hard for me to, to get through because of my past. So I was like a very reactive, emotional child and very reactive uh, adolescent young adult. So that's translated into some of my biggest weaknesses as an adult and something I'm constantly working on. All right, we'll take a couple more here, and then we'll we'll, we'll let you run. Um, the what do you think about Montenegro? Opinions about it? Because I've heard it's so beautiful, but maybe you were there just playing poker. Did you get unbelievable? Did you get to enjoy it? You went out, saw it, went out. Well, I mean, I only went from the Mastro Resort to um, Amman. Uh, absolutely insane properties. I mean, they're just it's ridiculously that Adriatic Sea is so beautiful. It's crystal clear and it's brisk and cold, so there's nothing like waking up in the morning before you go play and the beach is, you know, um, even though it's a rocky beach, the water is perfect. So I just go jump in there and uh, it was great. Me and the, I think only the Canadians could handle it this year at the stop because everybody else can't handle the cold. So it was like yeah. me and the bearded green woods and, and Tim Adams out there swimming around, but it was, uh, it was really refreshing. That's awesome. Uh, if, if poker didn't exist, what would you be doing instead? What would be you doing if poker wasn't your, your, uh, bread and butter? That's a great question. I know after poker, I plan on um, doing some things to help youth uh, in, in tough situations involving emotional intelligence and uh, just more charitable stuff, also health and well-being stuff, I guess. I have a natural love for, so you know, it could be anything from uh, helping design like better restaurant systems to uh, working with schools and helping kids out, something in, in that area, I guess, is what I would be doing. And where do you see yourself in five years or, or I guess even just so poker, do you have like a, do you have an expected shelf life for poker to see how it's running? Or do you say, oh, when I'm X amount, like I plan to sort of step back and maybe just play once in a while. Like, do you have a set time frame you're looking at or just go with the flow, see how you're feeling and, and see how it goes? Well, I'm, I'm already to the point where I'm playing poker because I, I love to be here. Um, so I got through the kind of requisite stuff that I was kind of forced to be at the table. And that's a testament to how much I love the game. I'm still here and I don't need to be. Um, but I, like I said, once that kind of feeling to fade fizzles, because there's so much work to remain your best. And I don't feel good playing something unless I feel like I'm at my personal best. 
And I just think that that's not sustainable for a very long time. So I imagine that I'll continue to work to be at my top for a medium amount of time. But I, I would I would guess that I'm not going to be like a top pro in five years would be my guess. Maybe even four, four years. I guess I won't be a, like a top at my top and at the top uh, at, at a competitive standpoint. So you'll probably see me drop down and stop playing things uh, when that happens. But you, you're still like a, a lifetimer for the main event and a few other stops. Probably would you? Will you always? I love I love poker, man. I'm always gonna play poker. I'll always have a home game. I'll always. It's just amazing. It's a great brain exercise. It's fun for social reasons, and I I love the game so much, and it's it's given me so much opportunity. And what is so speaking on that exa- exactly to that point? What is your favorite thing about? poker excluding the money i mean i guess not necessarily that's even your favorite thing but just you know money's obviously it's how you make your living and it's nice to win and do well but what what do you love like what what things about poker do you think apply to real life so much or that you that just you enjoy the aspect of poker what what is it the game theory element to it i really really enjoy i love learning the game um i love studying why things work the way they work and learning new mechanics of the game um just thinking about you know the value in poker is kind of learning how to think about things in terms of expected value and to not be results oriented and realize that you could have made a lot of really good decisions that still blew up in your face in that moment but that's fine i think that that's the most important thing that poker can teach you is you know that there are variants in all the decisions that we make in life and so much luck involved but if you're making plus EV moves, it'll all add up to booking a win eventually. Yeah, that for sure. I, there's just there's so many things that do apply to, to everyday situations in life, like you said, the ups, the downs, dealing with things, not being attached, all that. That that is uh, it's very powerful stuff. Is um is, is the Triton stop this one million pound? Is this something? Uh, how important to you is it the you know, like the the results wise are obviously you want to do well, you want to score, but is it something, do you feel like in a tournament, if you're knocked out, I would imagine you, you just want to make the best decision in the moment. So do you look more like for you, would you say you're more upset if you're, when you go out of a tournament, does it hurt more for you if you got unlucky or if you got it in bad? I would imagine that it's you, if you, you can't, the outcome's outcome. Is it for you more, it's more important to make the right decision or does it hurt less or more when you, when you get unlucky than when you do, or is it just the same when you're out, you're out. Do you look at it like that? I think it's just a matter of preparation. If I feel like I was prepared and in the right state of mind and I did everything I could do to show up and play my best and the rest is kind of whatever there's, there's a lot of swings and how your body's going to work that day, how your brain's going to work that day that you're kind of helpless to. And on top of that, there are days where you feel like a genius because you were put into a bunch of situations that you were very comfortable with. And then there are days where you feel like you're an idiot, but you were actually just like put into three of the most absurd, uh, rare situations. And on top of that, you ran into like top of range a bunch and you just like, you know, you just always felt like an idiot because you just lost every hand. And it's just kind of important to realize if you're, it's about your preparation. If you studied hard and you were prepared and you were playing your best that day and you, like I said, you were arrested, then uh, those are the things I'd be frustrated about if I, if I wasn't prepared. Okay. Well, Jason Kuhn, I know you are a busy man and this is, this is definitely prime time uh, for studying for, for everything for preparation. So I don't want to detach your routine too much. I really do appreciate it. Let's, uh, let's let Jason do the giveaway. We're going to let him for the party poker tweet. We got it primed up here so anyone who did retweet and ask a question is eligible let's uh let's copy this right here and then jason tell me count it down tell me when i am going to uh someone's gonna win a 55 five dollar party poker ticket on your behalf so tell me when to do it and i'll roll it and someone's gonna benefit here all right five four three two one roll it boom someone just won 55 from Jason Kuhn from Party Poker from the Flow Show podcast. It is Norbert from.
from uh he does he follows all the requirements he did it you got 55 ticket and on that note uh jason i am gonna i'm gonna let you go man i appreciate you so much staying even after i know you got your stuff so i'll be in the i'll be in the booth there in london bringing my son i want you to to meet our burning man joy the the baby joseph and I, i'll be rooting yeah, for you man there's uh there's some some crushers a lot of people i know here but you know always uh, always root for you man really proud of you on everything you've done and how much success you've had and, and really look forward to keep watching you and and see you grow as a poker player and person so uh cheers man hope we can have a drink catch up it's been a while and uh definitely one of the best weeks of my life was uh, was with you shared at burning man so i'll always hold on to that and uh hope to to keep up in better touch and, and see you in person here all right, brother. I'll see you in London. All right. Jason Kuhn, everyone. We'll uh, make sure you give him a follow on Twitter, Instagram, all his stuff. We're one of the good guys, one of the top players, and we will be back for another podcast soon. Got some other players in the, the Triton High Roller coming up as well as uh, the main event champion uh, Enzon we'll have in the near future here on as well. So thanks again to Jason from London. We'll be there on Sunday, and we'll see you guys very soon. Jason Kuhn is uh, is definitely one of the ones to watch out for over there. So we'll, uh, we'll see you guys soon. I hope you enjoyed it. Hit the follow button. It's free comment leave remarks let me know if you got questions for jason on twitter he may even knock in there and answer some later you never know um put it out there and uh we'll, we'll have jason back on a future episode hopefully uh triton main event million champion got a root for him so we'll uh we'll keep an eye on that and we'll see you guys soon cheers